before we start, um, we're just waiting five more minutes before um, we start the whole presentation. But do you have any questions of AARP or of the Alzheimer's Association? Alguna pregunta? Any Vamos a cumplir la presentación de ahora, pero un porcentaje muy pequeño de las personas que tienen Alzheimer's por um, la predisposición incrementa, pero no necesariamente quiere decir que, le, que vaya a pasarle a una persona. Yeah. Over the years, just like any other nonprofit, the, the real estate footprint gets reduced just because you know it's more economic and sens sensible. However, we do lose partnerships because we then are not as present in the area as, like we used to be and things like that. But we're really working very diligently to make sure that we're having more of a presence, especially like in areas like Eagle Pass and so forth. I will say one of the things that has happened over the last year, especially the mid part of last year till now, we launched a national partnership with ARP and they um, we now have greater access to the resources and things like that. So whoever is a ARP member, and she can definitely tell, talk, talk more about her program. Mm -hmm. um, but is that in Espanol? Or is that like in Espanol? So if anybody's an ARP person um, or enrolled through ARP, they can definitely have access to the resources for the Alzheimer's Association and vice versa. We have a co-branded website where we both are displaying our resources uh, throughout. So based on your, on your zip code, you can go in and type in what you're looking for, whether it's a decision, a program, education, and it'll pop up um, for everybody. We're trying to be, like I said, more visible in the communities, but we just haven't been as successful at other times. Would you like to say anything? I'm from the Rio Grande Valley, and this is an area that we jointly cover. Um, and so uh, we have some resources here on how to prepare to care for a loved one that's going through, um, you know, trying time, whether it's cancer or you know, Alzheimer's or whatever, and how to have that difficult conversation when they, they, you realize that they need more care than what you as a family member can give. And so we have these in Spanish and in English, and then we have some stress calls and um, prescription uh, containers and stuff. But this is a joint project that we've had with, uh, it's a national partnership that we have with the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, it's the first one of its kind, actually. Um, that a joint, that two nonprofits have joined together. And uh, we've, uh, as, as AARP is, uh, we've invested it was like 40 or 50 million dollars into Alzheimer's research uh, because we realize that that is um, an epidemic that's occurring. Uh, in our country, and so we need to start realizing that well, we need to more dollars and we spend dollars to try to solve this problem. Necesitan que me lo expliquemos en español. En español. Okay. 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 Básicamente, el, la Asociación de Alzheimer's Association y IARP nos hemos asociado, asociado nacionalmente para poder tener más acceso a recursos en la comunidad. Basado en su zip code, puede usted ir a la, al website y tener acceso a más información basado en las necesidades que tenga. En este caso está buscando un doctor o está buscando a um, quien venga a su casa a cuidar de una persona. O si para ustedes es como pueden tener alivio en el cuidado de alguien de Alzheimer's disease, está disponible en ambas um, ambas redes. En ambas redes. Estaban enseñando el ajedrez, porque ahí hay cada ejercicio, pero hasta me duele la cabeza cuando pienso para la nueva vida. Yeah. Entonces, no creo que eso se trata. So, basically, what I'm saying that, yes, there's things that you can do to improve your cognitive awareness, not necessarily what, you are, what you're familiar with. Like, if you're really good at crossword puzzles or puzzles or things like that, that's not necessarily going to challenge your mind. What's going to challenge your brain is really learning something completely new. For example, if you've never played an instrument, maybe learn how to play violin or play a guitar or things like that. Or if um, maybe take up art classes, things that are going to make your brain kind of think and process new things. Um, what is true, though, is that as we get older, we lose some cognitive 
awareness. Like we do have some diminished cognitive, we have some, right word, cognitive decline, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I got caught up in that loop, cognitive decline, just because we're getting older. How many of you have watched a movie over and over again and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, was that even part of the movie before? <laughs> all of us, right? I love Grease, I watch it all the time, and then it's before I know it, it's like, I don't even remember that being part of the movie. That happens to all, to, to Zuck. Doesn't matter what, it'll happen to all of us. It's when you start to have problems that really affect your daily life. When empiezan a ocurrir cosas que empiezan a afectar su vida del diario, por ejemplo, va más allá de perder las llaves de vez en cuando, va más allá de perder los lentes, o de no acordarse de una canción, o cosas así. Es cuando empieza a interferir con su vida diaria que hay que poner atención a esos síntomas e ir al doctor. No necesariamente implica que tenga Alzheimer's disease, pero de que hay un problema con, con el proceso. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks for coming. Again, my name is Maxine Vieira. I work with the Alzheimer's Association. I'm program, program specialist slash manager, however you want to call me. I manage it all. <laughs> I have 47 counties under my belt, and I'm very grateful that Veronica de la Fuente with ARP has managed to partner with us because we have a shared territory, and so we have been able to reach more people through both our, our um, constituents, and so we're happy to be here with you. Our goal is to ultimately work beyond this forum, and so the purpose of the forum really is to really have an assessment of what's going on in Eagle Pass. You know your community better than I do. I can't come in here and say what I'm doing in San Antonio is the best avenue, but really have a concentration, a concentrated conversation about who are the physicians are in this community working to make the diagnosis. Are you going outside of Eagle Pass to get a diagnosis? What's happening in that case? And also, what resources do you need to bring to the, to the um, Eagle Pass? El propósito de estos programas es simplemente para evaluar qué es lo que se necesitamos hacer como agencia o como o recurso para ustedes para atraer más a, a Eagle Pass. Si en San Antonio funciona muy bien las presentaciones tal como la que voy a presentar ahora, no necesariamente quiere decir que funcione igual en Eagle Pass. A lo mejor es más like the round tables, like the pláticas, en vez de tener una presentación o... Um, grupo de apoyo que sea necesario para poder para las familias que ya viven con Alzheimer's disease y si acaso tienen todavía doctores o, o, o equipo médico que no les puede dar un diagnóstico o tienen que salir de la ciudad para poder hacer un diagnóstico. So that's what we're going to talk about today. You good? Okay. All right. In your packets, you will have something very important. We don't lobby our legislators. However, we have the Alzheimer's Impact Movement, which does work on behalf of all families affected with Alzheimer's disease to make sure that we have policy being enacted and move forward. Que haya legislación y policías que puedan beneficiar a las personas que viven con Alzheimer's disease o las, las familias que, que cuidan. As of today, over $1 billion have been allocated to the research of Alzheimer's disease, care, and support. The National Institute of Health is the one that pretty much distributes those funding. Uh, outside of the, of the National Institute of Health, Alzheimer's Association is the second largest funder of research worldwide. And we're hoping that at some point we will find it here, sure enough. And now we have the allocation from ARP, $50 million not necessarily to the Alzheimer's Association, but to the research of, of a cure for Alzheimer's disease. So if you want to have your voice heard with your local legislators, please fill this out. We will drop it in their offices so they can know that you are aware of what needs to be done and what we need to do. Esto es simplemente un método de, de um, decirle a los legisladores que necesitamos más dinero para y más recursos para las personas que viven con Alzheimer's disease y que necesitamos más dinero para poder encontrar una cura para Alzheimer's disease. También en su paquetito tiene um, lo básico de Alzheimer's disease. Si acaso no la, no la tienen en inglés, en la mesa tenemos pocos apoyos en español que están disponibles para ustedes. Si quieren recibir, o if you like to receive information about clinical trials, this is also in your card. It's 
sign up. You're not going to get signed up for a clinical trial. It's just basically saying that you're okay to receive information about clinical trials. And if you've heard the news, si han escuchado las 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 noticias, no sé si llegan a asimilar, están asimilando aquí o no, pero South Texas Research Conference just happened. Acaba de ocurrir la la conferencia de de um, investigación en San Antonio, donde vinieron researchers from all over South Texas, Houston, Dallas, and everybody South Texas. They came in to talk about the latest in, in Alzheimer's disease information, clinical trials, and what they're doing as far as cures and things like that. So we're very excited to see what's happening locally in San Antonio. Lo que está pasando en San Antonio es que hay ahora un instituto de Alzheimer's disease para más investigación para poder hallar una cura a Alzheimer's. La más This little piece right here, the signing form, like any other nonprofit organization, we are also asked to provide demographics. We don't share your information with anyone. We just want to know who attended our programs and basically what your interests are for us to be involved in this community. How do you like for us to be more involved in your community? So those are some of the questions that are involved. If you don't want to give me an address to where you live or a phone number, just give me your zip code and your name and just fill the rest of the information. Feel as much as you feel comfortable filling out and I'll take it back. And lastly, it's just the questions. As you sit through the presentation today, take a look at these questions and have a very honest conversation with us. Let us know what it is that we need to be doing in order for us to provide support to your community specifically. When I've already said all of that, I can go ahead and start with the presentation. Any questions before we start? Bueno, yo sí puedo hacer una pregunta. Yo sí. cuido señores mayores. Ajá. Y ahora me cuido también. ¿Verdad? <risa> este, ellos como que sí están pasando por eso, pero no la tienen muy desarrollada. O so, como que apenas están comenzando uh -huh. a olvidarse de las cosas. Este, y luego les dices que como se hizo algo, no lo, no tenías que hacerlo. Oh, yo no lo hice. Uh -huh. Lo hice. Ok, se agarran de ahí. Se agarran. Y digo, oh, no estás bien. No estás bien. Lo importante que hay, hay que recordar que una persona que, a pesar de que no tenga un diagnóstico de Alzheimer's disease y lo llega a tener, es no ese. necesariamente significa que está en los principios de la enfermedad. Puede ser que ya se exhibió esos comportamientos de cambios de 5 a 6 años antes de que era el diagnóstico oficial. No. Es por eso que es muy importante cuando la persona que los cuida o, o as a caregiver, si, usted la, si es un familiar y está notando que algo está cambiando con esa persona, que los llevemos al doctor para poder que los sí. ah, Yo me imagino que no se ha checado de eso. Ajá. Y por eso yo quería venir también para acá para saber cómo actúan de primero ellos. Sí, 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 para ya cuando ya sepa yo que, cómo actúan, porque yo he estado ya con alguien que lo tiene ya. Right. Lo tiene, no que está comenzando. Y yo lo que quiero saber es que está comenzando cómo comienza. Los síntomas de cómo está comenzando. Voy a cubrir un poco los síntomas um, en, en la presentación de ahora, pero como les explicaba hace poquito, ese, uh -huh. va más allá de perder las llaves o los lentes. Es, es cuando ya empieza a interferir Porque con la vida ciudad. de ellos. Por ejemplo, si viven en la misma casa 30, 40 años, mismo um, neighborhood, ven las mismas cosas y de repente se pierden, entonces es que algo está pasando con su mente en ese momento. No, no que no sepan lo que haces. Le preguntas si la, se... la memoria de inmediata, la memoria inmediata se pierde. Por Ajá. ejemplo, si hora en la mañana comió cuando estaba con la fe, le va a decir no comí, ya. no comí. Pero sí. se van a acordar de las cosas que ocurrieron 15, 20 años. No, sí, eso, se borra, bueno. so, eso sí pasa con, sí. con la memoria. Okay. This is a very much redesigned presentation for the basics of Alzheimer's disease. One of the things that I am very proud of as being part of this organization is that we have an entire medical research department available to us. 
that backs every single thing that we present in the community. So, todo lo que hacemos en la comunidad basado con información, estadísticas, uh, síntomas y todo, está respaldado por un departamento completamente de lo que es investigaciones, los doctores, científicos y todo eso. Arrow key. And maybe some of you, if you're in the medical field especially, may already know what Alzheimer's disease versus dementia. But there's many people in the community that often don't know what Alzheimer's disease and dementia is or what each will entail. Muchas veces me preguntan, ¿qué es la diferencia entre demencia y Alzheimer's disease? Well, demencia es la palabra como la palabra cancer, like the word cancer. It's an umbrella term where you have the different diagnosis. Cuando dicen que el doctor dice, tiene una forma de demencia, okay, well, ¿Cuál es la forma de demencia que tengo? Puede que sea Alzheimer's disease, puede que sea Lou Body's disease, o puede ser Parkinson's. Son múltiples. Hay muchos diagnósticos que pueden ser demencia y no necesariamente Alzheimer's disease. Vamos a reconocer los efectos que hacen en, la, en, la, en el cerebro, por ejemplo. Some of the risk factors. So if all of us in the room share the same risk factors, what's predominantly in Hispanic communities? Hypertension and diabetes. One in five will develop the disease. Not everybody in this room will develop Alzheimer's disease. And we want to know why. We still haven't yet to discover what that reason is. Identify the three stages of the disease. <coughs> Talk very little about some of the current medications and describe some of the research that we've eventually done recently. And then, and then talk about the resources that are available to us here in the community. Who, el, who here is with the area agency? <laughs> Other than um, Veronica with ARP, she has resources available to you as well. Um, APEG, I don't know what resources you may have some available to through the university. And then, of course, the Alzheimer's Association, we have some available. And the social workers in the community have a, a vast resource that for everybody that they can come. Caregivers are there in the United States today? 
Sorry? 16.1 million people today get support on pay hours. So that means you as a caregiver, even if you don't know, identify yourself as a caregiver, how many hours are you providing a day for someone? If you have someone covering your home and caring for somebody at home, that's paid caregiving. But when you get home, say, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and you take over, that's like from 6 p.m. till 7 when they come back in. And that's if you're lucky if you have somebody coming in at 7, right? So, ¿cuántas horas se pagan? ¿Cuántas, cuántas horas somos de caregivers, de cuidadores, o de compañeros de cuidado para alguien que tiene Alzheimer's disease? Si lo pagaran, imagínense, 232 mil billones, 232 billion dollars worth of unpaid hours. We do believe Alzheimer's disease is the one disease that's going to bankrupt the U.S. doesn't matter what resources you have available to you. Uh, if you are planning properly, yes, there will be coverage, but if you're not, then you know, we want to be an advocate and pretty give you those resources to you so that you can have um, that available. I, by accident, found out about protective supervision for my mother. I was able to provide additional hours for her to stay and extend her stay at home. And that's because I worked in this industry. I didn't know that all those hours existed. Can you imagine those families that don't have access to the resources that we do? Las familias que no tienen acceso a recursos como nosotros y no se dan cuenta de cómo pueden aprovechar horas o más tiempo para que le cuiden a alguien en casa. So that's what we come in. Is Alzheimer's a normal part of aging? The challenge is that if you're of a certain age, because we're starting to see more individuals that diagnose younger, in their 30s and 40s, because there are genetic um, predispositions for that. When you go to the doctor and you're having problems with, the, with your brain and, and you go to the doctor and says, hey, you know what, I'm having some issues with my, with my memory. It's really interfering with my life. The challenge lies that many physicians are very dismissive of that, not because we're trying to knock the medical community. It's just that is the reality because it's not associated with a younger population. But we're starting to see more cases of individuals being diagnosed under the age of 65 with Alzheimer's disease. Pretty scary. We have a lady that she's in, she's 42 years old, and she is a, a retired Air Force veteran, and she had to retire early because she has memory. She has full blown Alzheimer's disease. It's pretty scary. So, entre más vamos y estamos asociando, diagnosticando mejor el Alzheimer's, se identifican personas que son más jóvenes, de los 30, 40 años, 50, que están siendo diagnosticados con Alzheimer's disease. Although the older we get, the more prone we are to probably developing Alzheimer's disease. Does not necessarily mean that it is a normal part of aging. It's when you start to see problems that interfere with your daily life. Yes, my eyes have Alzheimer's disease. Take a big bath when you get out of your condition. Ah, no, I have to. Aging me for a whole blown out. That's the invention, no, my mother, or because we have so many things in mind. Right. Yeah. I left it on, locked with air conditioning, with their full battery. And that's the truth. We, we live lives that are very hectic. We have multiple things that we need to do. You're worried about your kids, you're worried about your parents, you're worried about bills, you're worried about I mean, anything that can really affect your focus. Exactly. And sometimes that happens. I can tell you my experience. I, I sometimes am very foolish. I was, was putting a bookshelf together and I was telling my friends, I need I need the tweezers. And they go, well, how would you my tweezers? I'm like, the ones that move the screwdriver, she goes, next thing that's the liars. I'm like, oh my gosh. I felt so embarrassed because I'm, I pride myself in being very well spoken, but that didn't come together. So anyways. De repente pasa, que no importa qué estén haciendo, de repente se nos, se nos pasa por todas las preocupaciones que tenemos. Are you taking medication that perhaps may affect your memory? Are you drinking plenty of water? Are you dehydrated, for example? 
How many times do you go throughout the day and it's 3 o'clock and you haven't eaten yet? Right? It's at 3 o'clock, bitch, when your body's telling you, I'm sorry, but I need food. Either it's a sweet, it's going to be a soda, or it's going to be something. But think about it, how many times do we do, we put ourselves to that where we completely forget that it's 3 o'clock and we haven't yet had a meal. And so we want to go back and we want to make sure that we are taking care of our bodies and things like that. So the older you are, for example, if you're in your 60s or 70s, and that and that's what you're doing, can you imagine what that's doing to your brain? You're dehydrated. So we want to pay attention, because as we get older, the signals for us to identify hunger and thirst can change as well. People younger than age 65 can get Alzheimer's disease. I just gave that <laughs> So yes. <laughs> True. People develop the disease in their 30s, as early in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, but more than likely that's because it's a genetic disposition for it. Very small percentage, but we're starting to see those numbers more um, come to light. We, do, we did work with a family where um, the mother was 42 years old. She was still raising kids. Her youngest was nine years old, seven or nine. I can't really remember. And but she had started seeing symptoms when she was in her 20s. And the doctors were, you know, diagnosing her with everything under the moon except Alzheimer's disease, because it was just not possible at 30 something to have Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, that was the the outcome for that. But then. As they did a study of her family, her mom died very young with Alzheimer's disease. Both her siblings died very young and in their mid 40s, and then they discovered that it was a genetic factor. Is there something that could be given, like a patient for somebody that young to take? If they're that young and get diagnosed with? <clears throat> so, unfortunately, the only medication in the market right now is designed for the early to moderate stages. They won't reverse any of the effects. They might enhance some of the memory, but not do much more than that. And in many cases, depending on how far along they are in that disease process, doctors will choose not to even um, medicate. Yeah. Yes, sir? What about vitamins for your brain? Um, that just came out not too long ago. So, if your doctor gives you supplements, if your doctor says, kinds of foods for so that you can feel better, you can do that. But there is not one supplement or one diet specifically that will keep you from developing Alzheimer's disease. So think about this. Say you're an avid runner. You don't have a stitch of fat in your body and you follow a certain diet and you follow everything that's right for you to, to maintain. Still drop of a heart attack. That's the same thing with Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't matter what you do to keep you away from developing Alzheimer's disease. If you're on track to develop the disease, nothing's going to keep you from having the full effects of the disease, unfortunately. No se puede retrasar o que se detenga. Se puede detener a cierto grado, a mí, por medio de dietas o, o suplementos que el doctor les dé el receto, pero que diga que hay una, vit una vitamina específica o que hay um, un método específico para hacer que se haga re se reverse o que mm -hmm. mantenga mm -hmm. o se detenga, no existe en el So the focus here should be on education and lobbying for the cure. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's more chairs over here. Can you este lado? Can I have four? Dementia is the umbrella term for an individual's changes in memory, thinking, or reasoning. There are many possible causes of dementia, and Alzheimer's is the most common cause. Other causes of dementia are vascular dementia, which is marked by changes in the blood flow and the blood vessels in the brain. Dementia with Lewy bodies, identified by specific brain changes throughout the brain, 
that include the buildup of a protein known as alpha synuclein and frontal temporal dementia, which is marked by brain salt loss in the front sections of the brain or the frontal lobe. Each type of dementia may have distinct characteristics to cause specific behaviors in the individual, but there is also some overlap in behaviors among the types of dementia. Muchas veces la persona or the second most diagnosed dementia that we get today is the vascular dementia. That could be the result of either a stroke, hypertension, or diabetes. And that in itself can lead to a Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. In many cases, families are not only dealing with the vascular dementia, which can have very significant declines in a short period of time. For example, they can go to bed have a mini stroke or something happen because of their diabetes and wake up with very significant changes in their behavior and, and the way they may speak and things like that. Whereas Alzheimer's disease is a very slow progression. Like it goes from the short term memory first and then eventually goes into the long term memory. Cuando empieza a afectar la memoria, por ejemplo, la demencia vascular es un resultado por acaso algún ataque o you know, alta presión o diabetes. Y es muy significado los cambios que ocurren con la, la demencia vascular. Más sin embargo, Alzheimer's disease es un paso muy gradual que vamos a en, en, en fases, por ejemplo. In many cases, there's people that have never been diagnosed bipolar or with any other mental disorders throughout their lives. And when they get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, then they start having issues of both the behaviors of Alzheimer's disease in addition to the bipolar or schizophrenia or other conditions they may have. They can treat for this, for the bipolar disorder, but unfortunately, they can't treat for Alzheimer's disease. They may control some of the behaviors, but not really find a treatment for it. So. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Cuando se está en los principios de Alzheimer's, yo he sabido porque mi mamá lo tuvo. Entonces, a nosotros nos, también nos entrenaron así en San Antonio, pero dijeron que cuando está uno principiando con el Alzheimer's, como por ejemplo cositas que se le empiezan a, a olvidar a uno, pero si es frecuente, es cuando uno tiene que poner atención a eso. Otra cosa bien importante son los golpes en la cabeza. Mi mamá se dio un golpe en la cabeza, empezó con poquito Alzheimer, ya tenía, o sea, le habían dicho que estaba en principios, pero cuando ella se golpeó la cabeza, se cayó y se golpeó, el Alzheimer se fue muy fuerte. Entonces ya ella ya después de que despertó de ese golpe, ya su Alzheimer estaba muy avanzado. Entonces los golpes en la cabeza también tienen que ver muchísimo. Definitivamente, o sea, existe por el problema, like, especially our servicemen, our veteranos, por ejemplo, tienen problemas de memoria. Muchas veces un golpe en la cabeza puede ser algo instantáneo de que ocurre y ya tienen problemas de memoria, o es algo que, es, que empieza a suceder en fases, y ya cuando están en cierta edad se desarrolla completamente. If you hear about the NFL players, for example, that's one of the reasons why many are choosing to retire, because they are having memory problems. Some of the reasons that happen is because of the concussion. So, muchas veces un golpe en la cabeza de cuando fuimos niños o si tuvo un accidente de carro, se pegó en la cabeza. A lo mejor los efectos de memoria no son inmediatos, pero pueden ocurrir cuando estamos más grandes de edad, por ejemplo. So, that is a possibility. Many of us can go and have surgery and have the anesthesia, and if you're of a certain age, that can accelerate, uh, you know, the memory problems as well. Si la anestesia um, I've heard that because I tell my mother and sometimes she's very forgetful and sometimes she's not. And they said, well, check her urine. She could have a UTI. Does UTI okay. affect it? It does. So urinary tract infections really mimics a lot of the behaviors of that of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. That's why you know the person you care for better than anyone. And so if you know that their behaviors are really off the charts, and they're not their usual pattern of behaving, you want to pay attention. You want to go to the doctor to get the proper diagnosis. And I'm going to tell you this. As an advocate of someone, of two, two elderly parents, my dad had a UTI, and because he was like his behaviors were off the chart, he was automatically labeled with dementia. And I had to really get into it with, with his 
care team and says he doesn't have dementia. My dad was very fortunate that in 94, before he passed away, he never had dementia problems. He just had a UTI. I had to be very much involved in that care process to make sure that he wasn't labeled with dementia because it becomes a very dismissive diagnosis of our senior population. So we have to be very much of an advocate for them. Um, but if they have dementia, to deal with those behaviors in addition and then a UTI, then it does become very problematic because then you're dealing with those with an array of, of, of uh, situations where they're off the charts, they're very belligerent. They can't tell us that they're in pain and they can't tell us if something is going on. So they do become belligerent. You start to see them get more aggressive with you or they are not responding to what you're saying to them. So alguien que empieza a tener problemas con una infección de, de orina, entonces se vuelven un poquito más agresivos en cómo se expresa porque no nos pueden decir qué es lo que duele. So, entonces se, son más, um, con, se confrontan más con ustedes, enojones, um, things like that. The one truth though about Alzheimer's disease is who we are as a person does not change us because we have Alzheimer's disease. So if you were not a morning person and you have Alzheimer's disease and, and the person that cares for you expects you to be up at eight in the morning and that wasn't your routine, guess what? going to bite heads, right? So you know the person you care for better than anyone. So we want to make sure that whoever comes into the home to care for your loved one or if they go to a facility, that you let them know. Eight o'clock is not their cup of tea. It's not the time that they operate. Is it more 10-ish, 11, things like that, right? Who we are is not going to change just because we have Alzheimer's disease. Just, that's it. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. UTI, urinary tract infection. And the reason why we see it more often in, in senior population, because we all can have a UTI, in our senior population, it becomes that much more difficult for them to fight the disease. It's, it's more difficult in older, in our senior population to, to get rid of an infection. There's some seats. You can move the chair there. I don't know. We, there's seats. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do the full presentation just because we're on track. Oh, come on. So one of the things that has happened in recent years is the FDA has approved a dye that can be used when in combination with the MRIs to more accurately diagnose Alzheimer's disease. And when I say that is, party, miss you. I want to get to that right there. Any moment. So the dye can actually go into the brain and really identify when there's already pieces of the brain missing or there's actual shrinkage of the brain, which is what leads to a more accurate diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And so when the dye identifies those things, then the doctor's better prepared to, to render a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. El, el, um, hay un, un instrumento o un líquido que se utiliza para poder hacer los MRIs, para poder identificar en el cerebro si acaso ya se está encogiendo, si el cerebro está perdiendo uh, volumen, y si acaso se está perdiendo ya pedacitos del de, de cerebro. So, eso existe ahora, se puede con más, más efectividad, precisión, hacer un diagnóstico de Alzheimer's. So one of the things that I always tell families when I'm doing this presentation is imagine your brain being Swiss cheese. And in the Swiss cheese you have little holes, right? So that's our brain. Our brain, when it's affected by Alzheimer's disease, it is pretty much a little mass of cheese with, with, with missing ventricles. Our brains are the distribution centers. We have trucks coming in and we have trucks going out. When there's a disruption in that distribution of information, that's when we start to see individuals having more problems with their daily lives. For example, are they getting more forgetful than they before? Are they overpaying bills? They used to be really good at chess and no longer want to play chess. I mean, many of our senior populations, uh, they play in the loteria or they play bingo. And then all of a sudden they're not playing anymore because they still I don't like it. I've never played it. 
that's an indication that something is changing with their brain. They no longer understand the rules of the game, for example. Let's talk very little about our risk factors. What is the greatest known risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? Age. Age. Although it's not the normal process of getting older, it is still one of the greatest risk factors for developing Alzheimer's disease. The older we get, the higher the likelihood of someone, someone one in five, developing Alzheimer's disease. If all of us in the same room share the same risk factors, either hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, only one in five will develop Alzheimer's disease. That's a very high number. Unfortunately, what we don't know yet is why only one of us will develop the disease and not everybody if we all have the same risk factors. Hispanics are 1.5 more likely than any other group to develop Alzheimer's disease. African American, twice as likely. La, los Hispanos, un y medio más oportunidad de, de desarrollar Alzheimer's disease. Las personas de color dos veces más que cualquier otro grupo. ¿Y qué son los, los, los riesgos comunes de esas dos comunidades? Alimentación, la comida, alimentación. Hipertensión, alta presión, ¿verdad? Sí, Diabetes. Son los dos diagnósticos más, más relevantes en esas dos, en esas dos comunidades. Entonces es importante saber qué es lo que, qué es lo que causa Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease is marked by specific brain changes that result in the clinical changes in individual experiences, that is, changes in memory, thinking, or reasoning, and ultimately, Alzheimer's is fatal. The exact cause for these changes is unknown, but there are some hints as to what may contribute to an individual's risk. Age is the greatest known risk factor for Alzheimer's. And when we look at populations of people, we see an increased risk over the age of 65. However, Alzheimer's is not normal. <coughs> Family history is also a known risk factor. Research has shown that those who have a parent or a sibling with Alzheimer's are more likely to develop the disease. And that risk increases if more than one family member has Alzheimer's. When we talk about the genes involved in Alzheimer's, there are two categories that could potentially be involved risk genes and deterministic genes. Risk genes increases an individual's risk for developing the disease, but does not guarantee that they will develop Alzheimer's. Deterministic genes, which are rare for Alzheimer's, guarantee that the person will develop the disease. Deterministic genes, very small population, less than 4% of those people. So I mentioned to you some of the statistics. Women are two-thirds of Americans today living with Alzheimer's disease. We also live longer than men. We also, <laughs> true. <laughs> We're also the warriors, right? We're also the ones that pretty much carry. We don't know if those are the reasons why we have a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But they may be contributing factors to that, the stress-related factors that may come to it. So we want to make sure that as we continue with the research that we identify the reasons as to why people get diagnosed. Alzheimer's. The stages of Alzheimer's disease. One of the things that I want to keep, I want for you to keep in mind, and and for all of us that care for somebody with Alzheimer's disease, is that just because they got a diagnosis today does not necessarily mean that they're in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. It just means that they were officially diagnosed with the disease. Some of our, our, some, somebody will exhibit behaviors and changes at least five years prior to getting the official diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Si alguien tiene un diagnóstico ahora, no necesariamente significa que está en los inicios de Alzheimer's disease, mas simplemente significa que tiene un um, diagnóstico más acertado de Alzheimer's disease. In the early stage of Alzheimer's, an individual may be able to function independently. However, they may start noticing more frequent memory lapses. Friends and family may also begin to notice difficulties in the person 
and a healthcare provider may be able to detect problems in memory or concentration by conducting a detailed medical interview. Middle stage Alzheimer's is typically the longest stage and can last for many years. Damage to the brain cells can make it difficult to express thoughts and perform routine tasks, and this can lead to increased feelings of frustration and anger. In the final stage of the disease, an individual loses the ability to hold a conversation, control their movements, or respond to the environment around them. Cognitive skills, that is their memory, thinking, and reasoning skills, continue to decline, and this can lead to personality changes and need for round-the-clock care. So the three stages of the disease, the only one that can make the determination of when they transition will be your doctor. Will be the doctor to really say they're changing from the early to moderate stages, or whoever the health team care available for that person, they really determine when they're transitioning from one stage to another. Do we have any doctors or clinicians in the room? <coughs> And really they talk about, you know, um, again, early stages, humans start to see those changes. And, and I hate to use the example of leaving a pot on the stove, say boiling eggs or just, you know, heating up water because it's happened to us all, I guess, when we just forget that we have something on the stove. But it isn't something. When they forget about the, that, that water that they have boiling that pot on the stove and then all of a sudden the, the kitchen's on fire. Do you know that something is changing in that person and you want to go to the doctor to make sure that there's something that could, if it's reversible or something that could be treated can be taken care of even if it's Alzheimer's disease and then they have a proper diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. When they get to the middle to moderate to the late stages, late stages usually is the end of life process for many when they enter that in in it or it goes Sorry, I just had a complete block. When you enter the end of life stages, you know, you want to have a team in place. You want to have conversations with your family members. How do you want to be cared for, for for that stage? Do you want to have end of life at home? Do you want to be at a palliative care? Do you want to be given, you know, do you want to have your loved one be resuscitated if they're in that process. What conversations are you having with your loved ones at this stage? Whether they're diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or not any condition for that matter, what conversations are you having with your loved one to make sure that you know what their plans are? What happened? Yes. I'm sorry. That's okay. What happened? Okay, you said that that's about, that's in the middle. And you and want to start having conversations, period. But when you're in the middle, stages you should have a plan by that point you want to know what's going to happen they stages you can't make decisions for yourself anymore so what happens when you when you see and you know they start forgetting what they had for breakfast but they'll tell you what happened when she was seven years old but that's that's the disease process that's the disease process right but that's when you start talking about well mom you know what what what's going to happen um when you die you know do you want me to bury you here? You want me to take you to Mexico? You want to go to Chicago? Where do you want to go? Because we're most of our families in Chicago. What do you want to do? At first, it was like, oh, take me to Chicago. I said, okay. And then she started thinking about it. She said, you know what? We're all gonna go in a home. Just do here. So then now, I, every once in a while, I, I I ask her, does that does that make them feel like I'm gonna die tomorrow? Does that does that you know put them in a depressed state? I think that. I don't want I don't want to assume, but I think in the Hispanic community it's very difficult to have the end of life conversation many times. We don't want to talk about it for the same reason because well if I start talking about it, does that mean I'm dying? Like what's going on, right? But in reality it's it, it's a fact and it makes it easier the decisions that you make when they pass on. What are you gonna do to honor their wishes? How do you and even yourself, think about it. How do you want to be cared for? Do you want to be connected to tubes? Do you want to be connected to a machine? I'm going to tell you that being in this industry and knowing better myself, I don't have anything in that. I, I think I know what I want to do, but it's not written out. I don't have it written out. I, it is talking about your own mortality. I mean, your own end of life. And it, it is a difficult conversation. Having had two cancer scares, I should be better prepared, but I'm not. 
but I hope that my friends know me well enough to honor my wishes. Obviously, I'm going to take care of it. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I will take care of it, but I can tell you that having those conversations is difficult no matter if you're in the medical field, no matter if you're a social worker, no matter what where you at, it's going to be a very difficult conversation to have. But it's a good conversation to be prepared. Pienso, perdón, pienso que, pienso que una forma de iniciar una plática de esas con el familiar, yo lo hice con mi esposo y me sirvió muchísimo, porque yo empecé diciéndole qué me gustaría a mí para cuando yo muriera, o, o si yo estaba enferma, si me daba alzheimer como a mi mamá o algo y que no pudiera decidir, le dije que era lo que quería. Entonces propicié la plática para que él me dijera. Exacto. Entonces así no sentía como que yo estaba pensando que, ay, te vas a morir, ay, me murió mucho. Y me sirvió porque luego mi marido murió cuando no lo planeaba y cuando no corría tanto riesgo y ya me dijo que quería que le incineraran cuando muriera y eso. Exacto. No batallé para hacer la decisión. Exacto. Me sirvió mucho. Exacto. So having those para, para esos momentos sirve porque en el momento que alguien, por ejemplo, um, somebody passes on, there's so many things that you have to make decisions for that one of those things should not be how am I going to take care of my loved one in that moment, right? The best of intentions, family have the best of intentions to care for their loved one at home. That may not be the best avenue for them. Maybe it is a facility for care. But think about it. When they're placed in a facility, and I'm not saying that you should or not, it's just every individual decision is the best decision you make in the moment that you're facing one. Many times, families place their loved ones in the moment of crisis. Because either the caregiver has passed away, or the caregiver is no longer um, able to care for their loved one. And so if you don't have a plan of how you're going to care for that person and yourself, then it becomes a very difficult conversation and, and ways how to act and react to, to those situations. So it is one of those things that as an organization, we're huge advocates of making sure that you have your financial plans in place, that you have things in, in order so that you have and you are prepared for those, for those endings and things like that. If you know memory care, the average of memory care nowadays is over 13,000 a month, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. In, at least in San Antonio, some of those very beautiful, beautiful places I would love to live in. It's like I cannot possibly afford it unless there's a, a plan in place for me to be able to afford that. So those are the conversations you want to have with your families. Are we going to care for you in home? And if so, who's going to care for you while you're here? Or what sort of resources are available to us in the dorm? <clears throat> Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen, before we move on? So my goal is to leave you there only because I want to use the rest of the time to really have a more of an open forum, an open conversation. But basically, this is the presentation that we do in the community. If anyone here in Eagle Pass would like to learn how to be a community educator, please let me know, and I can definitely um, have a certification training here in Eagle Pass and get you started on this programming so that we can go ahead and, and you can help us deliver not just this presentation, but also um, the 10 warning signs. We also recently uh, released the dementia care practices recommendations. Those are for the long-term care facilities, medical groups, the professional uh, venue. And then of course we have how to manage behaviors and how to have better communication techniques and so on. So we have very a very vast uh, this is the programming that we can deliver in the community, but this is just one of those examples. And like I said, I just want to make sure that I have enough time for question and answer, and to talk about uh, as to why we're here before we wrap up in a little while. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? <coughs> yes, of course. My problem, well, my it's not problem. My concern is you know, we do have to certify. Mary Care? Care. Uh, our nursing homes here, if I'm not mistaken, none of them are <coughs> certified too. Although there are other places, San Antonio, we have a lot. There's one in first off. Uh, we don't have one here. We do have well, the skilled nursing facilities, the SNFs, they could provide. Yes. Sorry. 
We're not certified. We are working on the process to get certified. I believe you're talking to Ms. Cynthia de los Santos and yes. uh -huh. um, So we are, it's something we're bringing to the community. Uh, more awareness uh, in regards to that. We do have a unit right now, it's a memory unit. Um, like I said, we're not certified. We do have a lot of Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, the reason we opened it up, because yes, there was a lack uh, here in the community. So fortunately, the family members would have to send them to San Antonio, Pearsall, uh, Serenity House. <coughs> so our goal is to bring them back home have them close to the family. Uh, it's best for them to be with family here. So, I mean, like I said, we're not experts. We just opened it up uh, not too long ago, but we've had a lot of success. So it's working out a lot for us. Um, we do have wanderers, uh, memory problems, stuff like that. A lot of times, uh, I know somebody was saying about UTIs. Um, they get confused at home. We'll take them to a doctor. The doctor was like, oh, let's put them on that. Let's put them on this. I'm like, well, wait a minute. It's like, no, let's see what's going on. The underlying effects, that's where we come in. We start checking out those like, do they have infection, stuff like that. We don't have to medicate them. Um, the less medication we give, antipsychotic medications, the better for them. If we give antipsychotic, I mean, all they're going to be is asleep and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not. It's not proactive. It's not proactive, but it's not way of life. I was like, it's better for them to be up, alert, and doing stuff around. Uh, they're up and walking around and they go into different residence rooms and everything, but we keep an eye on them. We make sure they try to get out. We have an area where it's enclosed, it's fenced in. They can go out and be in the sun and stuff like that. So we're trying to bring a, a music therapy also. I mean, it, it's helpful now. We put music for them, they come down, they're relaxed. So there's different things we're trying to work with. The music therapy, do not heard of that. That's um, um, memory and music, it's really a great project because if you have old iPods or MP3 players that are no longer in use, you can upload music that's really unique to your, to your loved one, and they can listen to that. So if they like like the old music, I mean, they, you can play it for them and it really calms them down. Um, so it's a really good tool to sometimes mitigate um, behaviors. One of the things that we tend to see a lot happen in, in individuals that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or any other form of dementia is what we call the sundowning syndrome. And we are not familiar with that. It starts between three o'clock and seven. And it's just one of those times where you start to see behaviors that are just fastidiado. They're, I mean, they're tired. They don't wanna, they just don't wanna have anything to do with you anymore. But that's because they're tired. I mean, they're, they're, their limits have been rich and, they, and, they can, and they're tired. Maybe too, it also happens because they're not sleeping well at night, and then they're up. So they're, that that sort of cycle of sleep is also interrupted. So the doctor can help you mitigate that behavior, but not necessarily treat for Alzheimer's disease. So things like that. What is your suggestion for those wanderers? Wandering can be happening for many reasons, and then many times the most common that we hear is, "I want to go home." I want to go home does not necessarily mean the home that they've lived in the last five to 10 years, but really home can mean home that, where they lived when they were um, a child. Or it could also mean that they're hungry because we associate home with food and comfort. And so maybe they're scared and they need a hug. Or maybe they're like they're having a difficult time. It's a safe place. It's a safe place, absolutely. So when they're wondering uh, and you see those behaviors, that's basically what it means. Um, in many facilities, I know that they use like tools where they have like bags with clothing and stuff and they can pack and walk all the way to the door and then redirect their attention to something else. So then, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. It might sound silly, but do when you're dealing with the people that do have the advanced uh, Alzheimer's, do you go with the flow with their present conversation or yes. do you try to persuade? There's been debates and I've been to different presentations when they say differently. I, I've been to some presentations in San Antonio and they're like, no, you try to bring them back to reality. And then I've been to presentations where they say, no, you just kind of just go with the flow. So I'm a little. The one thing that I'm going to say to you as, as a representative of the Alzheimer's Association, our belief is that you go with the flow. Because if, if they ask you for somebody that especially passed away and you tell them your mom or your dad has passed away, because in that moment they're thinking that mom and dad is coming for them, they're going to start the grieving process all over again. And they can start crying and ensuing other kinds of behaviors. So you don't want to put them through that. If they're telling you the sky is purple, the sky is purple. 
<laughs> I mean, no matter what. Because what that does, when you go against what they're telling you, you really do then engage in, a, in contradiction and behaviors. And then it can escalate to the point where they can get very belligerent and aggressive with you, push you and things like that. Not because they want to hurt you, but because they're frustrated that you're not listening to them. And many times, even though you want to, like, how do you address conversations because they're trying to tell you something? And this is what I say. If children react a certain way around people and they're trying to tell you there's something going on with that person and why that makes them uncomfortable, it's the same thing with a person with Alzheimer's disease. If that person gets agitated when someone walks in the room, something is going on in that situation. They're not being treated well. Something, conversations are happening. So you want to pay attention to that situation. If they're in a facility, for example, and you walk in at 7 in the morning and you wake them up and they're not the routine, they're going to be upset with you. So what do you do? Just remove yourself from that situation and you come back. Give them 10, 15 minutes and they'll probably get over it and then just walk in, back in again. I'm sorry? Just let everything slide. Yes, pretty much. You have to let it slide because you're not going to change their their disposition. You're not going to change their words. You're not going to change how they're thinking in that morning. morning. And I mean, and I want, and I would like for you to walk away knowing that who we are as a person is not going to change just because we have Alzheimer's disease. It's just going to be, our behaviors are going to be amplified that much more. If the person had OCD throughout their life, that's going to continue and get even worse with because the filters of the brain are no longer there to, to moderate those behaviors. If you never said a bad word in your life and you get older and you're in that disease process, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be saying some F-bombs left and right because that happens, you know? Um, things that we don't talk about, you know, in the disease process, hypersexuality. That's still innate to us, that's still nature. So that still continues. And so those are conversations that we hardly ever have when it talks about Alzheimer's disease, but it's important to have those conversations with our loved ones as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was gonna ask a question that Rachel asked me. Do you tell them, do you make them believe their own lies, or do you just, when you go with the flow and you say, no, that's not the way it happened, this is the way it happened. So you answered that one. But they're not lying. Like when they say the sky is purple, no, that's the perception of things and that's how they think. And so one thing that we tell our families is like think about therapeutic living. If they're, if they're telling you, I want to go home, and if you want to mitigate the conversation, yes, we'll go home later tonight. If you, let's go ahead and do this instead. That may be construed as lying to them, but at the same time, you're trying to mitigate that behavior for them. Okay. And then the other thing I said is, um, uh, education in the community for the youth, for the use of nursing care, you know, when, when patients go to, to the nursing home. Because sometimes it's not, it's not the, the, you know, my mom that doesn't want to go to nursing. It's me, the daughter, that I can't see like I'm sending my mom to nursing home because I'm abandoning her. Because sometimes we have to realize when we, as um, non, non-healthcare providers and not trained, as to how to pick up my mother out of bed and how to do that, we can hurt ourselves. And if they go into the nursing home, they're, we're gonna you know, somehow talk to them and, and so long as we don't abandon our family. So this is the situation, and this is the best advice I can give you. When a family chooses to place their loved one, it's not because they don't want to care for them at home anymore, it's that they just don't have the capacity to provide the best level of care. Just because you're placing someone in a facility does not mean you're leaving them behind and you stop caring. How the frequency of your visits, that totally depends on you and how you can manage that situation. Many of us have a hard time watching our moms or dads deteriorate or our siblings, so we're going to be spacing out. Our caregivers, we want them to know, think about the level of care that you get at home versus the level of care that you receive in a facility. At home, you you are the provider of 24-7. In a facility, it may not be the best of avenues, but sometimes it's, it's a necessary avenue. There are shifts. The person can be there from 7 to 7. At 7, they leave. They leave the care of your loved one. They go back to their home, take their respite, take their time for themselves and be with their families to be ready to come back to care for your loved one. Whereas when you're the sole provider of care, who does that for you? Who gives you that, that breather? Who's giving you that reprieve 
from caring for your loved one. And we, and we in the community need to be taught there because previously I was just a big block. No, my parents are not going to the nursing home. No, big block. The Hispanic, my thing. But now when my my father, you know, needed that service, there was a nurse that came to me and explained to me that this is what it is. And so it was it was easier. So I'm thinking like, you know, um, I came here because definitely it's the first time that I hear that there is a an Alzheimer's um, information session and I want to know more about it. But the same thing for nursing home. For yes. so nursing home. <laughs> because we don't uh, I know like me, I definitely do not want to do that. But it doesn't mean if you check into the nursery, doesn't mean, okay, they're going to be there forever. It might be a, uh, a break for y'all to recuperate and everything. And once y'all are ready to bring them back home, then y'all can take them back home. It doesn't mean it's like, oh, you're going to take them there, they're going to stay there yeah, forever. No, it doesn't mean. I also want to point out that, you know, ARP has great resources for caregivers, not just for anybody caring for Alzheimer's disease, but for all caregivers. And you care for children. You pay your right. If you want to talk more about the resources, please. Yeah, well, we've, uh, in the past, we've held some, um, some different types of caregiving events with WellMed, the WellMed Foundation. I'm not sure if there's WellMed here. I don't think so. The Caregiver SOS. Uh, uh, Caregiver SOS. Um, but we've held some um, stress busting classes where we had about 15 people that came in for a class and learned how to kind of take them away from that setting of caregiving for a loved one that, you know, gets them stressed out, gets them, uh, you know, a little down and everything else. And so they got to be active in this group. So it ended up being a support group because now they're meeting on their own um, and everything. And listening in on the story, it's kind of like this the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Well, what happened in that room happened in that room and they don't talk about it outside of it. And so everything confidential uh, and everything. Um, they were basically sharing their stories about what they go through on a daily basis uh, as a caregiver. I was a caregiver, I mean, I wasn't even, I didn't even know caregiving, or caregiver was even a word. Um, I was a caregiver for my grandmother when I was in college. And then turned, you know, later my grandfather, then my, my dad, and then now I'm caregiving for my mother. Um, and so I know what it's like to be a caregiver. I mean, I, believe me, I <laughs> My father had five different types of cancer, and you know, having to deal with that on a daily basis. My dad was six foot four, two hundred and fifty pounds. Look how small I am. Having to pick up my dad out of bed and back out of bed, I mean, was difficult. I don't know where I got the strength to do it, but I did, um, and everything else. But you know, when the care became so much that yeah, I mean, we had to place him in, uh, in an ambulatory place where skilled nursing facility so that he could get the care that he needed for a certain amount of time, it worked because he got, you know, you know patient therapy and, and everything else. And so it kind of gave us a little time away too. But man, I gained like 15 pounds because we were eating out every day because you know, my dad wanted us to have dinner with him and lunch with him um, for a whole year. I never ate at home because uh, I was with my dad all the time. Uh, but caregiving is, is a stressful uh, thing to go through. Um, and we offer different types of, of classes also. We call them workshops. Uh, you know, when um, I think he's talking about end of life decisions, we have workshops on we bring in an attorney, a local attorney, uh, to come in and talk about special deeds, transfers, estate planning, because, um, and you know, patient directives too, because a lot of times, you know, you don't want to have something happen to you and then having your family argue out in the hallway, you know, because somebody has to be in charge. You don't know what your parents want or, or your loved one wants. And there's arguments and, and things like that that happen. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes they, they will boil over into the hallway. And you want to have those kind of things already set in place so that um, they don't have to make those decisions. I know that was talking about, like, Funeral arrangements. I mean, I, I have a funeral arrangement, uh, but it was only because you know, my older sister had passed away very suddenly, and we had to get all of these things in order, so now I have one. Uh, would I have ever thought about getting it, you know, sooner? No, probably not. Uh, and I've, I've had a cancer, well, I had cancer, uh, breast cancer a year or two years ago. I 
had to get everything ready because I, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Those kind of things, you, know, you just never know when life is going to turn, you know, throw you a, a wrench and you've got to, you know, do it. deal with it. And so I had to get those kind of things ready. You know, those are all the kind of things and the, and the, the programs, the, the outreach that you do, is it, I know that I get the ARP <laughs> um, and I get like those workshops in the, in the email, mm -hmm. but do you ever do like here and then put it out for the community to show up like here in the past? Well, we, uh, for this event, we were only able to do emails out. So we weren't able to send out postcards for the event. Typically, we send out postcards for all of our events that we have. Uh, we just had a different, we had a short time frame to, for this, this event. Um, we haven't done anything in Eagle Pass, uh, but you know we're trying to see if we can if we can start something here. Um, you know, we're trying to assess what what the needs of the community are as well uh, to see where we're we're going to be able to help out. And so, you know. Every community that we work with within AARP, because I, I cover McAllen, Brownsville, Laredo, and Corpus Christi, and here, um, it's all different. They're all very different. So, you know, some communities are about caregiving, some of them about livable communities, how to make their community walkable and livable for um, a person that's eight years old to eight. Um, others, it's caregiving. Corpus Christi, for instance, is about fraud, you know. I have a big shredding day event in, in Corpus Christi where I back up traffic all the way on, on SPID, pass off on the, up on the mall um, for three hours. You know, 800 cars come through to drop off bags of, of documents over so that they can be shredded so that you don't have to worry about your identity being taken. So we're just trying to see what, what kind of things, what's, what's important here. Um, and so this is, you know, obviously a, a big deal that we can, you know, we can obviously, obviously facilitate something, find a, an attorney to talk about those kind of issues that you all need to hear about, develop a, you know, a caregiver support program that we do with, with the uh, ministry's uh, division here, you know, those kind of things and see how we can partner up. Um, because I, I mean, I know that the community on this side is, is far away from a lot of, uh, a lot of places. It's, it's a desert, it's a health desert. Which leads me to this question: Where do you go to get a diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease? Right. Uh, we don't have a geriatrician here in Eagle Pass. They have one in a couple in New Orleans. Maybe one in the Rio, but not in Eagle Pass. And the geriatrician, the internist is different from the geriatrician. Uh -huh. Geriatrics. Geriatrics is really mm -hmm. one of the greater doctors just because they. they they manage the health of the senior population. And in many cases, they're either an internal medicine plus a geriatrician, so that really does help. Um, so a healthcare system that's close to us is United Methodist here. Or medical centers, I'm sorry. Is this a health system or is it? Okay. Thank you, Veronica, appreciate it. So if, if the challenge of getting a diagnosis is very apparent, then how do we manage to make sure? How can we help the community bring that to you? I mean, I'm not saying we're going to build a hospital or anything as it, but how can we better prepare the community, or how do we bring it to you as a community for to get a, a proper diagnosis? Well, I think we need transportation. <laughs> Any provider here locally that has transportation available for it? We used to have SWART, but SWART doesn't do um, cover with Medicaid or anymore. Well, Medicaid for life on that training. Well, they provide it for you first, but they don't provide it. Well, they're, they're, they're starting a new one, uh, like, a, like a new Medicaid little bus, whatever. But, uh, I know that obviously being in San Antonio we have a, a, a diverse medical community we have just more access to it we also have another uh, very diverse community with the Rio Grande Valley that is also a, a group that's growing in medical resources so that there, there is residents don't have to leave 
um, the area to get a diagnosis and things like that. But we understand that this is a challenge, you know, transportation, getting more physicians. Um, we definitely have an outreach to our physicians to make sure that we are providing them with the resources to reach out so they can get a referral to us and make sure that we're providing resources to them. Um, those referrals, it's up to three to six months before they can see a because I've gone through all of that with specialist clinics. Mm -hmm. They all come from out of town. We don't really have them here. So, um, me personally, I was trying to get an appointment and it was going to be it was January to uh, April, the 27th. Mm -hmm. Here to see the doctor. Because they he only come once a month. Twice a month. Mm -hmm. And didn't come to see them back up. So they were like, Getting appointments anywhere is hard. Even in San Antonio, you have anywhere between 30 to 90 day wait. When it was um, from January, and I couldn't get an appointment until April the 23rd. That's what they sent it out to me. That was a referral form. That's pretty sad. Yeah. So, if not having those resources available, then how does the community manage people with, I mean, obviously you have a nursing home and memory care units, you have a clinician team, you have a medical team that's available, but outside of that, how else do we, do you provide just wait? Yeah. Well, transportation for individuals. Right. Right. But obviously, there the primary doctor here, uh, they're not so they see signs of symptoms. <laughs> So that gets right away with Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, give medication. Some of them are misdiagnosed uh, <coughs> behaviors, so right away, antipsychotic medications. So a lot of times it, it, it affects them a lot. Um, instead of helping them, they're just in bed, they're asleep and stuff like that. And sometimes the family's like, well, now I don't have to deal with that, so it's okay, so they keep on giving medication. So their life is not there like they can. So yes, big time. So that's the problem. So earlier, I was—I think it was you who asked me, how do you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? And it is an elimination process, because there's not a one test to determine Alzheimer's disease. They can diagnose more accurately, like the Lewy bodies, the Parkinson's, Huntington's, and so on, because those have different biomarkers and whatnot. But it's important that you go to your primary care physician, because they will do that elimination process, because in many cases, we feel forgetful, we are having some of those symptoms. Could be the UTIs, the urinary tract infection. Could be that the person also has um, anemia, a vitamin B12 deficiency. That can cause and mimic some of those symptoms of memory loss and things like that. Cuando hay una deficiencia de vitamina B12 y estamos anemicos, puede causar problemas con la memoria. The thyroid. The thyroid. I mean, those things can, can be a factor. And those can be reversed. They can be treated and they can be reversed. The one thing that changes for us as we get older, the way that triggers it identify hunger and thirst are different. And so as we get older, we get more people diagnosed with dehydration more than any other population just because we drink less water and we eat less. And so if you go to the doctor and that's what's happening, they're lethargic, they're, they might be a little bit off, you know, confused and things like that. They're, they might be, you know, dehydrated. And so the doctor can diagnose that. If the doctor has had enough experience dealing with Alzheimer's disease, they can more accurately give a diagnosis. Even if it's a primary care physician, they can do that and hopefully get them um, on the right track and, and make the referrals. Even fortunately, it's the referral outside of, of um, Eagle Pass, and that's what's going to happen. Um, but again, we do make our resources available to the medical community to make sure that they are aware of how we can provide support to the families because. Once a diagnosis is given, the family goes into this, like any other diagnosis, denial, anger, frustration, the grieving process. I mean, you go through all those all those feelings, and it's not just the person who got the diagnosis, but it's also the caregiver. Because if, if, it's, a, if it's a couple of a certain age, and all of a sudden they're planning for retirement, and then they're in their late 60s and they're ready to retire and go travel or do different things and all of a sudden one of them will be struck with with a diagnosis that can be very devastating for that person for sure and so are those resources available for mental health in in the community for families to take advantage of no and, and the reason i'm asking this is like so we 
I'm, I'm not saying that we're going to be an answer to bring all these resources to you, but it does give us an idea as far as what resources, like do, does that mean that we then provide non-clinical support uh, for the family, meaning you can start support groups in the area that can benefit the family. You know, no one understands that journey better than someone who's on that journey or who has finished that journey. So that's the good thing. In San Antonio, we have a, a bereavement support group for families that, that have lost someone, but they start going even when they transition from the moderate to the late stages because we understand that that's a very long goodbye for many family members. But you start losing that person that you met. The person you're living with before and it's living with Alzheimer's disease is not the person that you probably married 30, 40 years ago. It's a different person altogether. So, any other questions? Support groups, education. What else, ladies and gentlemen? I'm sorry? Advocates. Advocates? Someone to advocate for the person with the disease or for the whole family unit? For both, for both. I will share my own personal story and say that when I came with my mom to hospice, I had very high expectations of hospice. Poor people, they don't know what they hit them. <laughs> and I'm going to say that I was, it was very disheartening for me to see that an organization that what I believe hospice to be was not what was really happening. And I pushed them, and, and I have to say I'm very grateful that they stepped up to the level of expectation of mine because they were not doing the things that I was expecting them to do or what I believe they should be doing. And I have a very good friend of mine who works in hospice and says, I need you to check me because I don't want to be having unrealistic expectations of what I'm asking for and what should the level of care be. Our journey, unfortunately, ended a few weeks ago with my mom. I'm going there. But I will say that the hospice rose to the occasion every time I pushed forward. They did right by my mother. So that was good. Sorry. No, no, no. Not happening. Not happening. But I just want to say that the more education we have, the better prepared we are to, to level out those expectations as far as you care. What I found very disheartening, though, was that if I am the advocate of one, and I'm pushing forward for things to get done with my mother. I can just imagine what they get by the minimum care when they're caring for someone else. But I think that's one of the biggest issues. If you're not aware of the expectation, what they're right. supposed to do, then you accept whatever they give you and you just deal with whatever whatever you right. get. Exactly. So when the day they call me and says, you need to get supplies for your mom, I said, excuse me? Why do I need to go out and get supplies for my mother? That should be, in, that's part of your service. I said, absolutely not. I am gonna call in an hour and I better see those supplies at home. So you really have to become that much more vigilant and more active in how you advocate for your, for your loved one. if you don't know, then you're gonna be stressed out trying to find that, trying to, right. you know, and that's the problem. Right. So it is important that we educate our families about hospice care you know. and the realistic <clears throat> expectations, and that we educate them about you know services at home and the expectations of that. And the things that you have to really give and pull so that they can have the better care available to your loved one. You were going to say, I'm sorry. No, that, that it's important to educate the families because the they're not aware of everything. As, as they have responsibilities, they also have rights. Right. And they don't know to exercise them when they're receiving any kind of, right. of care. They don't know that if through Medicaid they have transportation or that they have this or they have that. So it's really important to just, uh, I guess, in our community, it's just education would be the, the right way to start. And, and it's hard to have hospice conversations with our families because we automatically assume that it's the end of life. And, and it actually is. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be end of life tomorrow, but it could be that you want to make sure that they're going through that process in the best possible way. They can stand in the end of those últimos días de vida in una manera que están en paz, están se los están cuidando bien, de que no hay ningún contratiempo en ese cuidado y en esa transición. <coughs> and so it is, it's important that we teach. So one of the things that we are very much advocates is to include the conversations about hospice in, 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 our, in our plans, that we include the resources that are available. And, and I'll be familiar, your public resource, please let 
everybody in the room know, like I know that your area agency and aging, what resources do you currently provide? Well, we have, um, we provide just like general support for the community as far as helping fill out applications, we have the ombudsman program, we have the utility assistance program, uh, we just got a new program called, uh, it's called Unbound, and um, it's going to be for rental assistance, uh, and these are all for ages 65, 60 and, and above, so and it's for, for people that are at risk of either getting dissident or being that homeless or are having to move into like an elderly complex and you know things like that. The investment we provide advocacy for the residents. We are resident directed. Um, we we're kind of like the mediator between the families and the, and the care team. Um, a lot of times it's just you know over the phone. We do a lot of conference calls. We do a lot of. Um, back and forth, we all try to get to the main goal is to provide the residents and the best care processes. Right. I, a lot of times the family is more difficult to deal with than the resident. And, and it's not that we're not trying to please everybody, but we need to concentrate on the main person, which is the resident. And that's the end. And then at the end of the day, advocacy is all about the well-being of people you are caring for. It's not about what I have an expectation of things. What is the right thing for that person that you're caring for that you're doing? Yes, I have a question. Um, when, when, when elderly people that have Medicare, but they don't have Medicaid, and they really need a big provider services, is there okay. a thing? We do provide, okay, we do have um, this program within the area agency and aging that provides temporary provider services. We are, we're just kind of like a band-aid. Um, we provide you, uh, it's just a temporary service. Um, they can provide either respite service or the temporary provider services. So, But it's in order for you to be able to go and apply for long-term services in order for you to get to that point that hey, where do we go to apply because i dialed that said area and aging number and oh my god it's so confusing no oh, it's a uh, it's it's 1-800-224 um, no, no, okay, what is it? 800? Uh-huh, 224 4262. 4262. Because I tried going through those and see where I get in. I think you, you might have called 211. 211 gets very confusing. Um, <laughs> the lady in the back has a comment. They have all this stuff. Yeah. First of all, I don't see English. And then those numbers, you call it, I'll dial this, I'll dial this, I'll dial this, and the agent, it's really confusing. Well, I don't know what the answer is. I will say this. 211 is designed for one purpose. It's supposed to be a one-stop shop. I know that it's constantly emerging and changing. I will give you the shortcut of 211. Yes, go. So if you dial 211, you go one for English or two for Spanish, whichever one you wanted to choose, and then you do one for eligibility to get to the two on one. Start pushing the pound sign. You're going to push the pound sign maybe about eight or nine times. Eventually, it's going to ring and you're going to get a live agent every single time. Don't go through the room because you're going to be going around the clock. Now, I want to ask you to And we understand that having the resources online and also there's some proof that it's not going to take advantage of that. Everybody's doing a little bit. That somebody can address It's okay. It's okay. I just wanted to say that. I mean, there, if I may, mm -hmm. before we wrap up, there, wrap is, up. A, there is a 1-800 number where you, I don't know it right now, but there is a 1-800 number where you can call to request for my call. Thank you. And once you request that, uh, you can call one of the local case managers during the meeting at the department that's in that one part. Um, Health and Human Services Commission, and then you will have somebody who can make a home visit to your home, to <laughs> and they will make, uh, they'll, they'll explain the process to you, and they'll also let you know if you're eligible or not, and start the process for you. And also, if somebody has Medicare and a supplemental insurance, if you call the supplemental insurance, and specifically ask for respite services, but you have to be very specific what you're asking for. They may provide you some hours for the person that, that is the recipient of that benefit. 
If they say you only have 20 hours a month, maximize those 20 hours a month. If they say we can give you 300 for the next three months, maximize those respite, respite hours for their care. Yeah, because you'll lose them. And, so and, and, and I need to say, area agency and agent is all based on budget. It's correct. So it's only until funding is allowed. I mean, it's maxed out. Yes. So unfortunately, there are some resources available. Some of them are income-based. Some of them are age-related because you have to be of a certain age. I know that for Alzheimer's individuals that are diagnosed earlier, there might be some resources available through the area agency and aging, I believe, for respite services and things like that. But, you know, they are also the ones, area agency and aging are also the ones that have the conversations of, you know, the Medicare, like what plan is best, do you need a supplemental insurance, and enrollment period is what, October through December. Yeah. Any other questions before we prepare to wrap up, ladies and gentlemen? ¿Alguna otra pregunta antes de que empecemos a, a terminar la transición de ahora? Please, please, please give me back the assigning form, the one with your demographics. Feel at, fill up as much as or answer as much as you feel comfortable with so that I can take that back with me. ¿Alguna otra pregunta antes de que terminemos ahora? Aquí, por favor. Anything else before we wrap up? I really want to say thank you for paying attention. Thank you for being part of this conversation today. I hope that I gave you some information that may be useful to you. You can always call our 800 number. Every single one of our brochures has a fabulous helpline that's available to you 24-7. It is managed by master level social work and licensed professional counselors. So when you call that 800 number, you're actually getting a counselor and you're talking to them live. Um, and you can talk about whether you're feeling frustrated, if you want to talk about behaviors, if you want to talk about that they were physical thing for you, that conversation can happen. Yes, ma'am. I have some on the table if you want to take Yes, And also, yes, yes. And also, please make sure that you give me back this A card, the bottom portion of it, so that I can take that with me. And if you're interested in clinical trials, I'll give them back as well for me. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Veronica, thank you so much for being our partner in time.